the average age of Nisi was, was 18. And then, you know, like, on one hand, it's the structure within the family, you know, is, is, is the old man is still the boss. You know, you're still the son, but you're 18, but, but the government's looking to you. You're the one who's English proficient. You know, uh, you're the one who's a citizen. And all of a sudden, uh, like, you know, you're the shot caller. You know, and, and, it's, and it's vulnerable to both abuse, it's vulnerable to inexperience, it's vulnerable to all kinds of stuff that are, you know, that play against it. You know, I, I, at 18 years old, I don't, I really don't, wouldn't want very much responsibility because I can't handle it. But you're stuck in that position. And, and the responsibility is for making decisions that are pretty close to life and death, or at least, you know, feel like it. Because yeah, while the camps, you know, we're not death camps like, you know, like, like in Germany. You know, a whole lot of people did believe that they were going to be executed. And so the fear and the anxiety is there. And, it, and if you feel the responsibility to make those kind of calls and decisions on behalf of a community, you know, um, it's nervous. I mean, I know that when I, when I came to JCL as national director during redress, I was scared to death. I wasn't 18 years old. But, you know, that's, that's a... a, a uh, an issue in a campaign that was so serious, right? That if I messed up, my mom couldn't walk around J-Town, right? That, that's serious stuff. That's nowhere near the kind of pressure you would feel during the internment. Because then you worry about, like, pe you know, people are being moved out of their homes. They're losing everything, you know? You don't know if you're going to live or die. And you're 18 years old. I, I can't imagine it. Trying to argue for the creation of the 442 was, I think, a, a really admirable thing to have done, but it was deadly to have done it because, of course, if you put a segregated unit of Niseis fighting in combat, a lot of them are going to die. It's just who the Nisei were they would sacrifice in ways that almost no other soldier would. When I was in the army, I met this grisly old sergeant who had been in World War II Korea, loved fighting, loved being in combat. And he and I were having a beer and, uh, and he's, I said, um, he asked me, oh, here's how it went. The sergeant asked me, if you were leading a platoon of men up a hill, who would you take? And I said, give me Japanese Americans. I would only go with Japanese Americans. And he asked me why, and I said, because I know that every one of them is gonna go with me. If I say charge, they're all gonna go. There won't be one guy sitting back there trying to figure out how not to do it because that's just the way we are. And he said, you know, I remember those guys. I remember those Japs in World War II. So they were incredible. He says, I, if you asked me that question, I would have given you the same answer. That give me that unit because they were such an incredible, remarkable group of men. And they were willing to die for a belief. And, you know, that was the nature of the Nisei in combat. And like when and I was at JCL, I got to know vets because, you know, documentaries are being done. And then I started understanding more why they couldn't talk about it. Because I didn't understand that because I didn't come out of that experience. And then in the drug work, a lady, one, one of the her moms, she hands me this shoebox. And it's full of V-mail, you know, that thermostatic, you know, way they sent mail from, from the troops. So I read, the, you know, I start reading through it. It's from 442 guy, boyfriend. And, and, the, and the guy is, I think he's lame. He's writing tripe shit, you know, like, you know, I love you to the, you know, to the stars. Guy, this dude, this isn't going to work, dude. You know, this is really corny. Uh, but in, inside of there, you get... A sentence like, we lost so-and-so, man, but, and, and uh, we, know, uh, we know we need to do this to show that, you know, uh, we're loyal. And, we need, and then he says, um, we lost four today. You know, and you, you kind of re keep reading through it. And then 
they stop. And we keep going. And then the, the ones that come after are, Haro, he loves you, man. He really loves you. You know, it, it's like, um, people, People like with with the redress campaign and stuff like because we were successful, um, the community's been kind enough to give thanks to give recognition. But you know, like um, forgive the profanity, but we didn't know shit compared to what other people did. Yeah, uh, the last letter I saw in her box was from her dad. You know, and it says Haru. You know, um, I, I'm sad for you, but you know, um, you know, I know you two loved each other, you know, and uh, it was a great gift, and for a great gift there is a great price. You know, and their dad's right next. You know, like, where did this dad come from that writes stuff like this? You, you know, so. I'm like, um, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not religious, but I think I'm spiritual. To ask for their participation, to give up their lives, and prove their loyalty, to fight for America, when their parents and their families were incarcerated is, oh my God, sometimes too much to ask for, but it's the ultimate sacrifice. And knowing that those boys, and I keep calling them boys, even though I'm their descendants, is such a testament to heroism and sacrifice and ultimate duty, obligation, respect. Um, those things that we call, that we tend to say are American values, but are rooted in not only Japanese values, but are rooted in just human values. What will you do for your family? What will you do for your country? What will you do for your communities? What will you do for your descendants? So what resulted with the whole two of eight episode was it became it became self-predictable. I mean, you put a, a group of people together who are adamantly opposed to what's happened to us with those who tried to express their loyalty by answering yes, but, or answered no, because I have to stay with my parents, or no, because I'm offended by the question, for whatever reason. And then to get labeled as disloyal. It's one thing if the government does it, it's another thing if, if people in your own community direct that kind of an insult at you. I think the times are awful. Um, I don't know if I were an adult at the time, if I would have answered yes or no. I really don't know. Um, but I can understand those who answered no. I think they had a right to do it, and I think they did it for the right reason. Whether I would have had that courage, I don't know. I mean, I was in a conversation with Danny Noah, and we're sitting there talking and just having a casual conversation, and he says, you know, Actually, I think they were more loyal, more courageous than we were, we, the vets. I'm, and quite honestly, my reaction was, holy shit, are you serious? And he said, yeah. He says, think about it. Think how much courage that took. And we talked for a couple of hours about the No No Boys. In my personal history, in our personal histories as Japanese Americans, we're always fighting for it. Japanese Americans, uh, who fight for civil rights. But then civil rights is such a big umbrella. And in the, 19, in the late 1990s, when the LGBTQ movement was going forward and calling for their civil rights, and the JCL says, we're there with you. It's like, oh my gosh, I'm part of that group that makes me part of a group that's doing what's hard and what's right. Because so much of our country is just like, Bleh. You know, you know, we can't, you know, fight for gay, we just, who, who's, you know, who's gay in our organization? It's like, no, there are Americans who don't have these rights, but we're going to fight for them. And it was like linking arms and 
being personally proud of a group that's doing the right thing when it's so hard. I remember reading that in the newspaper and go, and I'm sorry I'm such a wussy about this, but it really means something to be proud of an organization that fights for people who are not Japanese American, but are just simply American who are fighting for their civil rights. <sighs> Blew my mind away. And that's what I try to continue to say as Americans. I happen to belong to the JCL. My membership keeps on going because I keep forgetting to pay my dues. But this is what it means to be American, to link your arms with fellow Americans who are not equal, who are not having the same opportunities, who don't have the same rights as you do, and saying, we belong together, even though we don't look alike, even though we don't have the same background. We're in this great country. We're going to make it great together. I'm with you, sister. I'm with you, brother. I'm with you, mom and dad, grandpa and grandpa. We remember you. We thank you. We, think we honor you and try to do the right thing because of our children ahead of us. <sighs> There's a lot to be proud of for belonging to the JCL. There's a lot to be proud of in, in its fight in continuing to do what's right.